about two weeks into summer league. And I think it's time to say who I was right about, about the 2022 rookies and who I was dead wrong on. Find out next on Locked On NBA Big Board. You are Locked On NBA Big Board, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome all. You're listening to Locked On NBA Big Board. My name is Leif Tuline. Rafael Barlow calls me the grinder because I watch more college basketball than just about anyone. With no college hoops to watch, right now my eyes are squarely fixed upon the summer league. And I've assessed who has superseded my expectations, who has gone below the expectations, and, and those I'm just not quite sure on. And, and that'll be coming up next. In this this episode, I, I think there are some guys that it's too early to tell. And you can make an argument summer league is not indicative of NBA success and you you have a very solid claim. But I think it's time to tell you who I feel I am correct upon based off my big boards assessment pre-draft uh, based off these two weeks. And then those who I am dead wrong on. Uh, thanks for making Locked On NBA Draft your very first le- listen every day. And remember, Locked On NBA Big Board is free and available on YouTube and all these platforms like uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and it's the best. And the Utah and listening on YouTube is probably the best way to help us grow. And one way to do so is comment on anything below. And today's question on the YouTube channel, and you'll look for it once this is posted, is which player that I said I was right on or wrong on do you disagree with, and why? And I'll try to keep my eyes peeled and try to respond to some of these. So let's let's dive right in. In the first segment, I'm going to tell you about some players I believe I correctly ranked on my board, whether I was high on them entering the draft or low on them coming in and feel their play has proven me right. In the second segment, I'll tell you who I was too low on and definitively wrong on based off these two weeks of summer league. And lastly, in the final segment, I'll tell you a few players who the verdict is not quite yet out on and whether they'll be proving my big board ranking on them right or wrong as NBA players. Starting from the top. And let's start this top segment. And I think if you look at the top of the board, my top two players, Paolo Bancaro and Chet Holmgren, shined and have arguably been the best two players in the entire summer league. So that's easy to assume the top two players that were, that were drafted and were on my board will succeed. So let's talk about some other hits, starting with some lottery picks. Jalen Duran, I had he went 13th. I had him sixth. And right away, his athleticism and motor, plus flashes of elite passing, have been on display. The very first play of summer league uh, for the Detroit Pistons was a lob from Jaden Ivy, who was the fifth pick and who I also believe will be a steal uh, to Jalen Duran. Duran dunked it. And then he had three more dunks in the first quarter. And Tyron Liu looked at a camera and said, he's going to break the backboard. And, and that's just a testament to the, the special unique athleticism for the youngest player in the NBA, Jalen Duran to be marveling head coaches like Tyron Liu and the play, who was a former player and has seen it all. Uh, Jalen Duran also went on to put up a couple impressive point performances in, in a kiss in a setting that's not necessarily catered to big guys. Um, it's usually guards who put up the most impressive scoring performances. Obviously, Paolo Bencaro and Chat Holmgren have really put up nice numbers, but I don't consider them as centers like I do Jalen Duran, who's a benefactor of good guard, giving him dishes and him being a defensive anchor. That said, defensively, Jalen Duran has stuck out to me. And I think that's what where his money is going to be made. I made a prediction with uh, with everyone on the Locked On Big Board crew, who's who's awesome, Rafael Barlow. Congratulations to him taking time off uh, to welcome a baby boy into this world. Um, Sam Ferris, awesome, intelligent guy, and Richard Stamen, the experienced, the guy we call the Clip God. We we did predictions, and if you want to check on this, I said Jalen Duran was going to be an All Star by the age of twenty four. So I gave myself a five six year window because he's very young. So that's pretty hard to be an all-star in, in, in early years, but he's just got these flashes that you can't teach. He, he makes these cross court passes and catches lobs, blocks shots, runs the floor like a deer and he, he catches everything. He's like a vacuum. And so he's a guy that I feel pretty confident. I was correct on having him higher than he went drafted. Um, we'll move on to a guy that I have the flip of the script on uh, Johnny Davis. Uh, he went 10th to the Washington wizards. I, uh, I had him 16 and I caught a lot of flack for it. Um, Raphael would, would pokingly jab there. Sam and I had some discussions about why we liked, why he liked Davis, why I felt lower on Davis and time will tell all of these will, we can say time will tell 
if they're going to be successful picks, if they're going to be busts. And I'm not saying that he's going to be a bust. I just think I was right in the sense that Johnny Davis has transitioned to the NBA, which was my which was my point that he has struggled to create space so far. He's reached double digits just once, and it was relatively inefficient in all of the Wizards games. Um, and he struggled to create space and is adapting to play without the ball. And I thought these were some issues. I likened him to a guy like Josh Hart, who I actually had very well ranked a couple of years ago, well above where he went at number 30 to the Lakers. Uh, Josh Hart, to me, is a defensive player who rebounds well and hits corner threes. I think that's the role that I see Johnny Davis in. And the reason I struggle to have Johnny Davis high uh, higher than 16, which is where I ended up with him, uh, was because I didn't see him as this on-ball creator that a lot of people did um, because of what he did at Wisconsin. I thought that was a, a unique situation and that his game is is hard to translate to NBA levels. The guys who do it are the all pros. Um, DeMar DeRozan scores in the mid-range over people at 6'6". Kevin Durant, who's about seven feet tall, does it. And so Davis has a tough way of scoring, which is touch and physicality and very few parlay that into uh, NBA, all NBA level scoring. And, and I think to have that, those rain, the, the, the leash has to be so loose for someone to uh, try to score in the mid range like that. I didn't foresee that happening for a guy like Johnny Davis. Um, time will tell though. And I'm happy to hear and ma- imagine that maybe one people disagree with in that comment um, that I'm going to leave out there. And I want to hear what got, what you guys disagree with me on. Um, and then there's two more guys I felt like had lottery talent that I ranked 11th and 12th respectively on my big board, and they went lower than that. And I feel like they've proven me right with their performances in summer league. I'll start with my guy that I had ranked at 11th. Blake Wesley went 25th to the Spurs, and he's outperformed the 20th pick Malachi Branham so far and has shown with NBA spacing, much like Jaden Ivey, where, he, where I feel like the bigs on his team being a, the only freshman out of six, seven contributors and five or six of them were seniors on a Notre Dame team. Uh, the NBA spacing allows elite bursts to be on display. He's been able to get to the rim at will, get to the free throw line, knock down jumpers, which is the big question mark. Will his jump shot translate and improve? And he's done so off the dribble and on the catch and shoot. He had one really inefficient day going about two of 16, but he's largely impressed and he's shown NBA defensive versatility and impressive pressure on the ball. Uh, Blake Wesley said in a podcast uh, with Knuckleheads podcast with Quentin Richardson and Darius Miles that he felt like he was the best player in his workout with the Spurs, which he called easily his best workout. Uh, He said that. And then I looked into who was at that workout. One of them was Malachi Branham, who's now his teammate, was picked five spots ahead of him. The other was Dyson Daniels, who was picked number eight. And Dyson Daniels um, is is a is going to be interesting to monitor with the Pelicans, but that's interesting to hear that he felt so confident about that. And so far he seems to be the better of the two between himself and Malachi Branham, obviously lots of time to go, but I think he's certainly outperforming number 25. And I think 11 seems to be a good number for him. And I, I'm proud. I'm proud of that pick. Um, next one, Tari Eason. He was picked number 12 on my board and maybe should have been even higher, but definitely higher than where he was picked at 17th. Tari Eason is on the Rockets and they, they got a player who many regard as the top player in the entire draft in Jabari Smith. But it would be probably if you were to vote, vote who's been the best player on the Rockets summer league team, it would probably be Eason uh, on who's been better between those two sec products. Tari Eason is a walking double, double Tari Eason has gotten double doubles in each game he's played. And he's been a, he's been a menace on the basketball court, getting to the rim at will causing issues on defense, his switchability is something to marvel at. He he rotates onto bigs. He switches onto guards. He d- decided I'm going to guard Paolo Bancaro in a couple different possessions and really made it life hard for Paolo Bancaro, who I rated number one, I feel like has lived up to that expectation. And that's just a testament to Tari Eason's versatility, athleticism, and phenomenal, phenomenal just being a gamer. People questioned his basketball IQ, and that's a large reason I think he dropped off on a lot of big boards. I ended up moving him to 12. I had him there for most of it, and I, I thought about putting him in the top 10. Now I really wish I had. And I wonder if 12 is too low, but this is the section where I say I'm right. I don't think I was right that Tari Eason was uh, was number 12 in the sense that he'll be the 12th best player. I think he's going to be better than that. But I feel like I was right that he was picked higher than where he was picked, and so I'm proud of that one. And I think Tari Eason has a chance to be a star in this league. I think people with that body type, and he's most likened to Kawhi Leonard because of his enormous hands, 
um, but also the seven three wingspan, just the vertical athleticism, people that figure out a play. He shot 80% from the free throw line. Patrick Williams, OG Ananobi are a couple others that fit that mold. They rarely fail, and I think Tari Eason's proven he won't fail, but he's going to exceed expectation and potentially be a star. And the last guy I have real quickly – was Bryce McGowan's at 21. Uh, he, that's who I, where I had him, but he went 40th. Uh, the reason I had him 21, puts the ball in the hoop. That's what he does. He knows how to score, and that's exactly what he's done in the summer league. He knows how to get to the line. I think that's a really good trait and a good indicator of how well a guard's going to score. He's very thin and slender, and he's still able to get to the rim and finish. Um, and, and he lastly showcased this with a 24-point performance on seven of 10 shooting for the Hornets. That was like kind of the, the tip top performance. He also opened with a really good performance on the opening day of Las Vegas summer league. He's a guy that is going to need to build strength. He's going to have inefficient performances because his shots not quite there, not quite dialed in, but he, he, when he hits it, it, it makes everything so difficult because he's got such a, and he moves like an NBA wing. He moves like an NBA player and he just isn't strong yet. So players that rely on finesse, and grow into their bodies and still are able to score solely relying on finesse are guys that I really feel confident will translate in the NBA. And so far, Bryce McGowan's has certainly exceeded the 40th pick. It's not all rainbows and sunshine and, and celebrating the guys. I feel like I accurately projected on my board, but there are some misses too. Coming up next, I'll tell you who those select few are, but first I want to tell you about bet online. Bet online is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. Bet online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including betting, live betting, esports, and scores. And bet online remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports. And events including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today and you, or use our mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Uh, one thing to monitor is this is painful as a Jazz fan to say is they Bet Online has odds on where Donovan Mitchell will land next. Bet on that if you want to. Bet Online, where the game starts. And welcome back in. And as I said, I'm Leaf Tulane, by the way. They, they call me the grinder because I watch more college basketball than anyone. So some of these I watched plenty of, but I still missed. It's not all sunshines and rainbows, and it's not all hits on my big board. I have a few notable misses that appear to be obvious already. And one guy I'm almost ashamed to have missed on because I watched so much of him, and I felt like I was at the forefront of being high on this guy. I moved him down, and without further ado, it's Keegan Murray. Keegan Murray, I had him at eight. Uh, I had him six through almost the entire draft process, but made a late move to eight because I, I fell and I became enamored with a player in Benedict Matherin and, and Jalen Duran, that the two guys I scooted up and I really think they've done well. And, and I said I was right about Jalen Duran already, and I believe it. Keegan Murray, though, he has a claim to be the best player in Summer League, and I may have, he may be my vote for Summer League MVP. Uh, he's he's most recently paced the Kings against Chet and my next miss is Thunder. Murray had 29 points, seven rebounds and four steals. And he largely did that against Chet Holmgren, who, as we've seen, is a defensive nightmare, an absolute menace on defense. Keegan Murray has five 20 point performances. And, and before you get too excited, I will say that he played in the California Classic. Um, and so he, he has more games. So he's not he's not just uh doing it more than anyone else because in and, and, and more games. But he is doing it more and, and consistently. And my concerns were Keegan from Keegan Murray were, can he score as the man on an NBA team, as the go-to guy? How will he score when they run him off the three-point line? How will they score? How will, how will he score when the guys guarding him are, are just as quick and just as big as him? Whereas at Iowa, typically, if they were smaller, he'd take them down to the block or dribble through them, power through. If they were bigger, he'd take them to the perimeter and use speed or three-point shooting to shoot over the guys who sagged off because of their foot speed wasn't able to keep up with Keegan Murray. Well, the answer to that question is he'll do it in any possible way, and he does so efficiently. He scored in the mid post. He scored on the block. He's shooting the three off of movement, which is something I didn't expect quite this early despite shooting nearly 40% from three at Iowa. Uh, he's shooting off curls. He's shooting – off of pin downs, he's head faking, driving to the rim, slow stepping, finishing on Euro steps and dunking. 
gets out in transition. I had no questions about Keegan Murray being a good NBA defender. Like, despite being the most, not being the most phenomenal vertical athlete, I knew his defense and his instincts would translate. And that's what first drew me to Keegan Murray. And I mentioned at the, uh, at the top of this segment, I felt like I was at the forefront of the Keegan Murray hype. Uh, about a year ago, two years ago, Luca Garza was set to be the national player of the year. And I was like, man, who's that freshman number 15 who just gets every loose ball, rebounds the ball, seals it, blocks it. It turned out that was Keegan Murray. He was coming off the bench. He then became a start and really helped Iowa. They reached the top five at certain points of that season. And I was like, man, I'm going to have my eyes peeled for him. And in various podcasts, I talked about how I thought he was my first team all Big Ten. I didn't quite say all American. I wish I had. But long story short, I was low on Keegan Murray. And I, I'm saying already this was a miss. The Kings, though, I think they should have taken Jaden Ivey. And I still believe that way. They certainly did not miss on Keegan Murray, and I think they got it right. That He can be a scorer. He can be a supplementary piece that fits beautifully with DeMontis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox, both the pace with Fox and the cuts off ball when Sabonis is operating in the post. Uh, Keegan Murray is a stud, and I think he's got more star potential, all-star potential, than I gave him credit for, and I'm willing to say I'm wrong on Keegan Murray, who I had at eighth, which is you know still pretty high in the draft, but I was wrong. The next guy was wrong. I teased it. He was on the he was on Chet Holmgren's Thunder. Uh, Jalen Williams. Yes, there's two Jalen Williams. This is Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. He went number 12. I had him at 22. And I watch a lot of WCC basketball, and I, I was very well aware. This guy at Santa Clara is pretty good. I want to watch him play Gonzaga is my mindset. And at Gonzaga, he put together pretty good games. He even had a crossover dropping his now teammate, Chet Holmgren. Uh, and, and I was like, man, usually – Usually when a guy breaks out in his junior year, you, you say, well, he's older than the competition, especially in a conference like the WCC, where there's where there's less top end athletes. I, I, I decided, well, I think I think that's got to be a large part of the reason I had him at 22. So he was in, safely in my first round grade. Um, the highest he reached on my big board at one point was 19. Um, and you watch him at the combine. He was an excellent athlete. He tested with the first time he was him and Donovan Mitchell, the only two players to ever have a wingspan that is 1.16 uh, times as long as their height, a like a full court sprint that was at a certain speed and then a vertical jump that was over 34 inches on a standing vert. So elite athletic company that moved him up my board. And then I watched him play at the combine. He wasn't scared to play in it, which was a big plus and he dominated. He was the best player in the combine. And he was and he was great. That said, I wondered, man, how is he going to do when there's surefire NBA talent around him and surefire NBA talent on the opposing side? And how will he do without the ball? Because that's largely what he did. He played a six, six point guard role at uh, in a, at Santa Clara, where he dominated WCC guards for the most part. Well, he off the ball excels. His cutting timing is exceptional. He still shows off that vertical in a functional way, dunking the ball. And he he. He's chasing records for most dunks from a guard in, in summer league. It's, he's got to be. Um, he's shooting the ball exceptionally well on catch and shoots from deep. Often he shot a lot of uh, off the dribble, and he was good at that. So that was a con- slight concern. I thought he could shoot because he shot well in percentages. but And he's done that. And the most important thing I've noticed is he's an imposing defender. He's guarded guys like Jared Butler in the Salt Lake Summer League. He's guarded wings like Josh Christopher, who's really excelled as a second year uh, for the Rockets. And, and I think he's been – really good in all these facets and he's you know you say well he's he's not a master of any trait but he's really really good at all of them and that's something i very much value especially when you're drafting not in the top five so at 12 i think it's possible he was a steal at 12 and i was certainly too low on him at 22 and coming up next stay tuned to hear about players that where the verdict is not quite out on whether they are hits or misses for where they were drafted because you know it's, it's summer leagues early summer league. You don't know for sure on any of these guys, but there are some that are more ambiguous on whether they're going to be successful or not. And we'll tell you who I think those guys are coming up after a couple messages from local sponsors. Welcome back into locked on NBA big board. I'm leaf to lean. I watch just about as much college basketball as anyone. Rafael Barlow, for that reason, calls me the grinder. And today we're going over my big board and where I've got hits, misses. And we're at the part of the day where I'm talking about guys that I'm just not sure whether I was right about them, whether I was wrong about them, whether NBA teams 
were correct about that, where they were selected and just some guys that are mysteries. And, and we don't know based off this summer league performance or the lack thereof, how their careers will be. Is it indicative of, of, of how their performances have been? So if they've been exceptional, they're going to be exceptional. If their performances have been, been poor, are they going to be poor players? I don't know. So here are a few that I will outline that I, I just don't have a feel for. And this one did not shock me that he made this list. That was Usman Jang. He was drafted 11th by the Thunder, one pick ahead of Jalen Williams, who we just spoke of uh, as a guy I was too low on. Usman Jang, I had a 15th on my, uh, on my board. And he was a relative mystery to many because he played in New Zealand, really, really struggled early in the season in New Zealand. Then he played far, far better. He's got this tantalizing mixture of height and finesse. He's about 6'10", and he's very thin. He's about 190 pounds soaking wet. And you, you, you had a feeling that he may struggle to adapt to NBA physicality. That seems to happen to guys that fit this mold. Well, he still has been able to create space. He's finished somewhat poorly at the rim. I've watched a lot of these Thunder games because they played in Salt Lake, and they also are playing in Las Vegas. And they're just high profile because, you know, they've got Chet Holmgren. They've got Jalen Williams. they got the other Jalen Williams. You want to watch them play. They've got Josh Giddy, of course. And I think having all this talent around him has made him blend in and be a harder read to watch. Usman Jang has made some jaw-dropping plays where he steps back at 6'10 as a 19-year-old and shoots a step back three. And you're like, wow, this guy's really, really good. What can he be? Then he plays the passing lanes well, and you're, you're impressed. But then defensively, he, there's a couple times where he gets beaten on closeouts. There's a couple times where at the rim, he misses a bunny, and you're like, man, just put your body into this guy, and you'll be able to score that. Well, because of the finesse with which I feel like he's forced to play with because of his lack of physical strength at this point, I think I'm more lenient on those type of misses at the rim than I would be if he were a more developed or older player. And so I feel like the the the, the fawn, the cult that he appears to be on the court, much like uh, Pole- uh, Pokushevsky, appeared to be early in his career, and he seems to have gotten stronger as well. Um, I'm more lenient and more ambivalent on whether he's a success or not. And I, I think time will tell. My, my gut is leaning that he needs to have a, a defined role and that the Thunder, because of their early talent, already showing all this, uh, this acumen for scoring and, and defending between Jalen Williams and and Chet Holmgren, that he may be passed out by this young class, especially with Shea Gilgis Alexander and Josh Giddy obviously dominating the ball for the Thunder, that it may be hard for him to have a role as a uh, a scorer and a passer, which are two of the traits that made him the most appealing. So I'm a little lower on him, but I, it's just hard to give up on a guy who's that young and that raw. A.J. Griffin, I had him number five on my board, and you're wondering, okay, why would you have A.J. Griffin that high? And I, I will admit that I, I think if I were a general manager – and I was, and I had the job of preserve and wanting to preserve my job um, with with questionable job security. I don't know if I would have put him fifth, but I will say I love what AJ Griffin puts up, puts forth. He's a great shooter. He shot fifty percent ACC play um, coming off of an injury. The question with him is, is health. He still hasn't played in the summer league with a toe injury. He came into Duke uh, having had ACL surgery out of high school, and then he had a knee injury at Duke. The question about him is, can he defend and will that athleticism come back? And it's hard to say uh, whether he's going to live up to the fifth ranking I have. And it's probably not. And that's where I said I thought I should have played it safe and stuck with Keegan Murray and Jalen Duran at five and six. But, you know, there's hits and misses. And I was too low on Keegan Murray and I may have been too high on AJ Griffin. But it's hard to rule him out because the fit in Atlanta is beautiful. He's the 16th pick. And now he'll be tasked with knocking down open jump shots created by DeJounte Murray and Trey Young. AJ Griffin has to defend at a level that makes him probably a better defender than what Kevin Herter was to be a success because I think he's going to shoot better than Kevin Herter. And Kevin Herter shot 37% and is regarded as a very good shooter. AJ Griffin, 6'6, 225. And an exceptionally hard worker. Everyone I, I've heard, uh, I have a f- very close friend who's close into the Duke program, and he said that Coach K said he's a coach's dream and that it's very good that A.J. Griffin um, didn't go to Virginia because he fit in w- with what uh, Tony Bennett preaches in terms of the gospel, and he's a very religious, dedicated kid, and that he 
no matter what you think of AJ Griffin, he's going to work hard and at some level he's going to succeed, whether it's going to be at the level of the fifth pick. I'm not sure. So I'm going to say, I'm not sure there's, there's some ambiguity here. He may be a little too high on my board and I can admit that, but I'm going to say this is an unknown, especially not seeing him from the summer league. Another guy we've barely seen any of from the summer league is Nikola Jovic. He went to the heat late in the first round. I had him ranked 25th on my board. I feel like that was an appropriate ranking, but what you saw from him in the little he's played in the summer league has been dazzling. He opened up with a 25 point performance, uh, nine rebounds. The guy's got lots of offensive talent. And I think if any team can get a guy to defend well, heat culture can do it. And Nikola Jovic is six ten and long. And at the bare minimum, he can play a, play an offensive creator, much like Davis Bertans, but he's got more versatility to his game. The reason I'm not sure what to make of that pick and how to rank him if I were to do a redraft just two weeks in, which is ridiculous, but bear with me. It's because he's been injured and and the defense is hard to gauge when he's playing with new players and, and his offense in games where he's been dinged up has been non-existent. So you see this tantalizing flash but from Nikola Jovic, but you just don't know how consistent that is. Uh, so that that's one. And then if I were to add one more, this is not on my notes, but I'm thinking of who who I've been impressed by, who I haven't been, and and where where it's going. Uh, I've got I've got two that I had ranked fairly close. I had them both in the top 20, and that is Ty Ty Washington. He went 29th to the Rockets, and I've been really really impressed with his ability to get where he wants in terms of NBA spacing. You see that you hear this kind of trope, this cliche of Kentucky guards outperform where they are drafted it, it's true of shea gilgis alexander it's true of emmanuel quickly it, it, it is true it, it seems to be true that they're ready for the nba and it seems like uh ty ty washington is is ahead of where he was drafted at 29 because he looks to be a contributor and at 29th you're not sure you get a contributor but that said there are some questions with the way he plays is his defense gonna and it, is defense going to be ready to play at the nba level is his creation going to be able to thrive like it has when it's in the actual NBA game rather than summer league where he's catching off the off the bounce with amazing athletes around him creating a lot of havoc and, and d- uh, demanding a bunch of attention where Ty Ty is a lower uh, player on the opposing team scouting report and the last one's Mark Williams Mark Williams was picked 15th and was a perfect fit everyone said the Hornets are going to take him at 13 and, and then they end up getting the 15th pick through some trades and you wonder you wondered, well, he's a perfect fit, but is he going to validate the 15th pick? Um, he, I had him at 17 on my board. Mark Williams was the MVP of Duke. Despite Paolo Bancaro being ranked number one on my board, I thought Mark Williams was the most important player on that Duke team. He was the cleanup defensively, made them a good defensive team, and his offense, much like a guy like Rudy Gobert, uh, was underrated because what he did was simple, but it was effective. Uh, so far, the Hornets have given him more reins to do things which has been it, – it's there's been some ups and there's been some downs. There's some turbulence to his effects of having a larger and expanded role. He's thought to be able to shoot from three down the road. He hasn't shown that quite yet, and there's been some times where he's had happy feet catching short rolls. But I think these are growing pains that he'll get through and really thrive for the Hornets, especially as a roll big with a pick-and-roll savant like LaMelo Ball. Well, that'll do it for me. Thanks for making Locked On NBA Big Board your first listen every day. For your second listen, get up to date with the latest news and rumors in the NBA in just 30 minutes every day with Locked On NBA. Locked On NBA, your daily NBA update in just 30 minutes. Once again, thank you for listening, and let me know what you think in that comment section of guys that I pegged as being correct about, about where I had them ranked and how they performed in the Summer League. On, and on guys that I said I was wrong. Do you disagree with any of them? Do you agree with them? Let me know in the comments section below. And thanks for listening to Locked on NBA. Have a great weekend.